Welcome to your weekly UAS news update. And this week I want to talk about the FAA that's coming back with some remote ID questions for certain type of pilots. I want to talk about the hobbyist drone registration that is being extended by the FAA. I want to talk about France that actually selected eight UTM providers. We'll talk about more, that in more details. And lastly, I'm going to talk about some drone delivery regulation because, well, because I, there are some questions this week and I did some research and I thought I would share. So let's get to it. And the first thing this week is the FAA is actually asking for information from low-flying manned aircraft pilots. This is helicopters, agricultural uh, aircraft, and in public safety pilots. Those who fly at low altitude, the FAA wants to see if they would benefit from getting the information from Remote ID. You've heard about Remote ID, and if you haven't, then it's time to get out of your cave. Uh, maybe you're new, I'm joking, but <clears throat> if you haven't heard about Remote ID, it's the information that would be shared by the UAS uh, with, well, the rest of the world, the FAA, law enforcement, the public, and then other aircraft around the area, and uh, unmanned aircraft, that is. And the FAA is trying to find out if uh, the low-flying aircraft would actually benefit from getting that information. Now, the request is actually in the form of what's called an RFI, Request for Information, and the comments can be submitted until April 16 of this year. Interestingly, I had to think about this for a little while, and um, I think this would actually require additional equipment to be installed on the manned aircraft in itself to receive the data. And from a pilot standpoint, I fly airplane, I understand what it looks like in the cockpit. Um, I've got a master's degree in human factors, and if you're flying low at very high speed, or if you're just flying low, quite frankly, close to the ground, the last thing that you want to have to do is look at a screen to find out if there is a UAS somewhere in the area. So from a human factor perspective, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. This feels like this information would not really be something that's all that useful to them. Now, on top of it, if you think about priority, UAS have the lowest level of priority, so manned aircraft technically have the priority. Now, I know what the FAA is trying to do. Well. Uh, on paper, I think the FAA is trying to really find out if this could save somebody's life eventually down the road. Now, what I'm hoping the FAA is not trying to do is to find a reason to get on with these remote ID uh, requirement that they had in the, uh, in the NPRM. They basically had a bad idea. They, they shared it with the world. The world said, hey, this is not really a good idea. So now they're trying to backpedal to find stuff. Now, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, uh, but I hope this is not what's happening here. But again, if you're one of these pilots, or if you know someone who's flying at low altitude, have a discussion with them and see what they're saying about this. To me, it would actually make a lot more sense if we actually provided the UAS pilot with the information of aircraft that are flying at low altitude and then having a warning, kind of like, um, it's called a TCAS uh, in, uh, in manned aviation, which is when there's another airplane coming in the same location, then uh, there is some kind of a warning in the cockpit that tells you that there is another aircraft. This would be, to me, a lot more useful. The UAS pilot has more... Uh, chances of actually getting out of the way rather than the other way around. Anyway, that's my two cents. Let me know what you think in the comment. I'll be interested to hear your answers about what is going on here. The next topic I want to talk about is the hobbyist registration. If you are flying as a hobbyist, you know you have to register your UAS. What happened is that back in 2016, the FAA said, hey, guess what? Everybody has to register their UAS, including hobbyists. And then somebody took the FAA to court and they won. And the FAA had to back paddle and said, well, hobbyists don't need to be registered anymore. So at that point, the FAA said, well, you've got two options. You can either leave the $5 that you gave us and, uh, and then we'll call it quit, or you can ask for a refund. Um, I was actually one of these people that had registered my UAS at the time. Now, I did not ask for a refund because it was just five bucks and it felt like just uh, more waste of my time than anything else. So um, when in 2017, the FAA came back and said that under the National Defense Authorization Act, hobbyists, again, are required to register their drones. So as of December 12, 2017, everybody, again, had to register their drones. To make it short, the FAA said last couple of days ago, that if you had not requested a refund and you had registered your drone before December 12, 2017, 
then they're extending your registration all the way until December 12, 2020. So three years from the time that they requested a re that they, they re-requested that you register the drone. I hope this makes sense. So if you've registered before prior to 2017, uh, to December of 2017, then you basically got a free extension. I did, I'm part of uh, one of the uh, the people that did this and, uh, and now I get a free extension. I don't really fly my drone as a hobbyist anymore, but hey, there you go, you get the information. So in this case, you don't actually have to do anything. Your registration has automatically been extended. You can reprint a new updated registration card from the FA drone zone if you want to. And then the FA is gonna send you a reminder six months before it actually expires. So six months before December 12th. The reason six months is because six months is the maximum amount of time that you have uh, where you can register, re-register early your drone. Uh, before six months, it doesn't count. Next thing I wanna talk about is France has decided to choose eight UTM providers. Now, a couple weeks ago, maybe last week, losing track of time, um, I reported that Unifly was selected by uh, Canada to provide UTM services in their airspace. Well, France has gone a different uh, route. And the reason I don't usually talk about other countries outside the US, but I think this is interesting because this is something that the FAA is so far behind, I think, I feel. And um, FAA has the DJAC, which is the, uh, the equivalent of the FAA in France, has selected eight different providers. And these eight different providers are gonna be kind of on a trial basis. And at the end of the trial, then the F I don't know how many they'll select, but but less than eight for sure. So each of these providers will have a different area of France and they'll be able to kind of display their uh, their system and then help people make a decision. So I don't know who's gonna be making a decision at the end, quite frankly, but I think this is kind of an interesting concept. Instead of picking one, they're picking eight and then they're gonna put them through the trial. Um, again, UTM is the unmanned uh, traffic management, which is something that we currently don't really have in the US, something that remote ID would basically make possible uh, once we can share the information of the UAS with everybody else. The last thing I wanna talk about is something that I had to kind of dig around because uh, I had asked myself the question a while back and I never really uh, went into the regulation to find it. Uh, yeah, if you ever need fun, something fun to do, go into the regulation and find stuff out. Um, the FAA has said that in order to fly your UAS beyond line of sight and to deliver packages, you need to have a Part 141, Part 135 certificate. Now, the Part 135 certificate is associated with another part, Part 119. And if you're not familiar with the regulation, the, the, the 14 CFR, which is the Code of Federal Regulation, Title 14 is for the FAA regulation. And, uh, and within that title, there's different parts. Part 107, I'm sure you heard this. Part 101 used to be the one for hobbyists. And then part 135 and part 119, these are designed for commercial operators that are involved in air commerce. Now the FAA has said that if you're gonna be delivering packages for uh, beyond line of sight, then this falls under air commerce and now you have to get a part 135 approval. Now there's not many companies out there, there's three companies that have an approval, the Amazon, the Wings and uh, and uh, no, I can't remember. And UPS uh, is the third one that has Part 135 approval. It takes a lot of money to to get the approval. It's usually a design for air carriers, so think about larger aircraft. But th that's basically the bottom line. The FAA says, well, hey, it's legal if you want to fly within VLOS and you want to carry stuff under your drone. It's actually legal to do this under Part 107. But if you want to do it beyond line of sight, then you need to have a waiver. And then the FAA said, well, wait, the waiver is just not the only thing. If you want to do this and you want to carry pa uh, packages, then you are going to need a Part 135 operation. Uh, people that actually have a beyond V visual line of sight, a BV loss uh, authorization will tell you that specifically in their uh, approval, it says that they cannot carry uh, packages because, well, because the FAA has put an additional stipulation in there that you need the part 135. Now you may not really care about all this. Um, I just thought I would share with you guys. Uh, as you may know, the news is kind of uh, overtaken by the, uh, the C word. I'm not gonna say the C word because I wanna go this entire a video without talking about it. And I uh, just wanted to give you some actual UAS news. So this is all I have for this week. I hope you stay safe. I hope you uh, have fun flying your drone. Please go out there if, uh, if you can do it in a remote area like I do. And um, I will talk to you guys next week.